Hi, I'm Glenn Wild, and I am the owner of Sensational Brain and the creator of the Brainworks products. And the purpose of this video is to give you a little overview with some things that you can do with our Brainworks sensory diet visual cards, activity cards. And I'm just going to go through all of them for you. Now, there are two different options which we spoke about in the previous video, if you've had a chance to watch that. One is to be the DIY type where you have a digital membership to Brainworks Online. If you have that membership, your file folder tool that you could create for a classroom or for an individual child will end up looking something like this. And this is the inside. If you order one of the kits or the physical products alone, like a single family kit or a therapist kit, you will receive products in the mail that allow you to simply and quickly put together this pre-made version, essentially. It requires a little bit of sim simple assembly. Now I'm just gonna show you how we use this tool. We recommend it for kids primarily between the ages of five and 12. Some younger kids do okay with the number of options that are inside. We begin using this uh, with some kids as young as three successfully, but the general school age is gonna be your best bet. They like the interactive format, they like the colorful pictures inside, and they really begin to understand this analogy well. So let me tell you about this tool first. This is called our file folder tool. The kids begin to identify their sensory speed through the tachometer on the outside. And this correlates to the colors in a stoplight. So if you just stop and think about what a car is doing at each of the colored lights, it helps you to make sense of how we're making the analogy between your sensory speed and a car speed, okay? So think about a car at a red light. At a red light, a car is not going anywhere fast. In a human, that means you're slow and sluggish, might be leaning on your arm, kind of daydreamy, um, not processing quickly, just kind of unmotivated. Sometimes these kids are called the bump on the log kids. They're there, they're physically present, typically not a behavior problem, but they can have difficulty learning because information isn't being processed very quickly. So their sensory systems are identified as being on red. All of us feel that way from time to time too. When a, yellow, when a light is green, let's go to green next. At a green light, a car is on go, full speed ahead, which is fine unless it starts exceeding the speed limit and then it can be headed for a crash. So we really see two different types of kids who start out on that green speed. One type are the over-responsive kinds of kids. For these kids, they're having an over-responsive reaction to incoming sensory information. Everything is bothering them. It's too much. They're frazzled and overwhelmed. With that analogy, it's actually their brain that's going too fast, so to speak. Those kids need to be encouraged to choose the red arrow activities to help them calm down, slow down, and relax, okay? But there's another type of kid that's on green also. And these are the kids we call our sensory seekers or sensory cravers. These kids, their bodies are literally going fast. They're the kids who are running and jumping and spinning and crashing and driving their teachers crazy and probably their parents as well. So they're, they are going too fast and we need to find an outlet for that energy. Now for those kids, we actually find that green arrow activities are the ones that work best. The green arrow activities have a green arrow pointing upward in the upper right hand corner and these activities help us get going, perk up, and be alert. So our sluggish kids who start on red need green arrow activities. But our sensory seekers also do best with green arrow activities. And that's because they need help letting that energy out, so to speak. They need an outlet for that energy. If we're looking at it from a neurological standpoint, what they really need is help reaching that really high threshold where sensory, processed, sensory information is processed and responded to appropriately. So we're giving them that extra stimulation they need in order to reach that high threshold. It's kind of confusing. But it's very similar to what we tell our own kids, you know, when they're, when they're bouncing off the walls. We say, go outside and run off that extra energy. And that's essentially what we're doing here, too. We're giving them an outlet for that excess in an attempt to reach that high threshold that they have. So these kids are on green. They need more green. And the analogy we use is to say that their gasoline tank has too much gasoline in it. And the quickest way to burn off that gasoline is through the green arrow activities. So those are our sensory seekers. The over-responders, these kids who, they're going too fast because their brain is spinning and overwhelmed, they do best 
with the red arrow activities that help them calm down, slow down, and relax. And our little passive kids that start on red, who are slow and sluggish, they need the green activities to help them get going, perk up, and be alert. Our yellow arrow activities are always safe. These are mostly good proprioceptive activities that are good for everybody. So if you need red, you can choose red or yellow. If you need green, you can choose green or yellow. Yellows are pretty much always safe. And in our, in our analogy with the tachometer, yellow represents modulation, meaning you're at that just right speed. Because theoretically, at a yellow light, a car is at that just right speed, where it can proceed with caution if it's safe to do so, but it could also come to a stop quickly if necessary. So that's really where we want kids functioning the majority of the time, is on yellow. Now, after kids determine what type of activities they need, we can encourage them to select three or four or five, depending on how long their sensory break is going to be. And then they can make their selection and move them to the outside of the file folder. And then this becomes a visual schedule for them. The purpose of this tool is to structure their sensory break time to make sure that they're using that time wisely from a sensory standpoint. So we can then set a timer, maybe for 10 minutes, and say, you can do any of these activities in any order until the timer goes off. Or I could provide even a little bit more structure by saying, uh, do this activity for maybe two minutes, and then take it off and move on to the next activity. So you can use that a number of ways, but it helps to structure that sensory break time for kids. Now we have a couple of other options for our younger kids or kids who are more cognitively impaired. Do better with this first then option where the first represents a task and the then represents sensory input. Now here, I really would want to get the child modulated before I even pull this out. But then this becomes a way of keeping a steady flow of sensory input going. So we work for a specified amount of time, we meet their sensory needs. Then we work again, and then the sensory needs continue to be met on an ongoing basis. The kids perceive this as a reward because sensory input is usually inherently rewarding. But what we're really doing is providing them the input we know they need in order to be successful when it's task time again. To prevent this from seeming like I'm accidentally rewarding improper behavior that may occur during the task time, I use timers a lot. I may, may set a timer for two minutes and say, we are working on this until the timer goes off. And then, no matter how the bad the behavior is, still when it's done, we go on to this because this is essentially a very basic visual schedule and so we want them to begin learning that concept. Now, because these kids are younger or more cognitively impaired, I'm definitely going to have more control over the choices. So if I know they need a red arrow activity after they complete the task, then I may hold up one or two or three red arrow activities and say, choose one. They make the choice, put it on, do the task, and then we follow through with the sensory input. So that's how that can be used for your younger kids. And if you are the DIY type with BrainWorks Online Membership, there is the option of printing all of these cards in the four inch version, which works really well for that first then version. You can also use the cards to create key ring tools. These are good for our older kids who would be a little bit embarrassed to be seen with something like this, or our kids who are going to more of a general ed type of setting sometimes. And here I may create this with the child and lay out like 30 or 40 sensory activity options that I think would be helpful for that child. And then I'm asking them to select 10 or 15. And when they make that selection, we talk about what equipment do you need? Which class periods do you think that would be most helpful? Is there anything we can do to make sure this doesn't cause a distraction to other people or uh, turn unwanted attention on yourself? So we just have those conversations. That way, even if they never pull this out in public again, I feel like there's some learning occurring through the creation of it. And it's still something physical that they they can show their parents or their teacher, and then those adults can remind them to use their key ring strategies. One more thing that you can do with our picture cards is to use them to create visual schedules to support problematic routines. Like for this child, he is transitioning away from the computer, needs to go to circle time, and that's a very difficult transition for this child. So before he even gets on the computer, the teacher puts on the non-negotiables, computer and circle time, and then leaves some open spots before and after circle time. So when it's time to turn the computer off, he's already made these choices beforehand. And what he sees is it's time to turn the computer off and get ready for circle. But first I get to do these two sensory activities and I chose these. So I'm going to be a little bit more willing to comply. And after circle time, I got to choose a very highly preferred form of sensory input to engage in 
um, upon completion of circle time. So this helps from a sensory standpoint by building in sensory input that I think he needs to be successful in that transition. And it also helps behaviorally because he sees, yes, I have to do this, but I also got to do these things and I chose those things. And it helps cognitively because it helps me to prepare for what's going to happen over this next period of time. So you can also use our cards to build in some, um, it build into some existing routines to support kids that need that help from a sensory standpoint. Okay, if you have any more questions, feel free to email me at gwen at sensationalbrain.com. This is a very basic overview. We also have a one-hour webinar available for only $5 called the BrainWorks Approach to Effective Sensory Diets that's available in a view-on-demand format and also offered live periodically, and you can find those options available from the Trainings tab at the top of the website at sensationalbrain.com. Thank you for watching.